Today's homework lesson will cover two important events that happen once the Revolutionary War breaks out, the Battle of Bunker Hill and the Declaration of Independence. Get out your history notebook and turn to the next blank page where you will take notes and draw sketches about what we learn here today. This homework video's guiding questions are, why was the Battle of Bunker Hill important? What was the Declaration of Independence? Why was the Declaration of Independence important? And what were the grievances that were listed in the Declaration of Independence? So where are we on this timeline of events? Well, so far we have learned about the Boston Tea Party in, the Dece in December 1773, the intolerable acts that followed as punishment in 1774, then the First Continental Congress, which was a fail because the king did nothing about the letter that was drawn up. After that, Patrick Henry speaks out about no taxation without representation in March of 1775. And one month later, the Battle of Lexington and Concord takes place with the shot heard round the world. Today, we'll be discussing what happens next, the Battle of Bunker Hill which takes place only a few months later after Lexington and Concord in June. The Battle of Bunker Hill is June 17th, 1775, and the Battle of Bunker Hill is one day um, at the end of Boston's siege. So a siege is a series of battles that lasts over several months. And after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, um, Lots of militia from all over Lexing or Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut all congregated here in Boston because they were upset that the Redcoats had fired at Lexington and Concord and they were going to war with the Redcoats who were living among them. So this is the first major battle after Lexington and Concord. Patriot militias want the Redcoats out of Boston, and the Redcoats wanted to keep control of Boston and the important harbor for their ships. So the Redcoats got it wrong. There were two hills that the British wanted to take in order to be able to bombard the Americans from a distance. You can tell that Boston is a peninsula, so all around in the harbor, there's British warships, and they have cannons on them. And those cannons are firing into the town of Boston, where the colonists are. It's only called the Battle of Bunker Hill because the Redcoats thought that they were on Bunker Hill. But they were actually on Breed's Hill, a nearby hill, also in the city of Boston. The Battle of Bunker Hill actually took place mostly on Breed's Hill. So it's sort of a funny mistake and it makes for a good trick question. So who was in charge of the Redcoats? General Howe is the Redcoat general officer and he fights against the Patriots under the command of Colonel Prescott. Here's just an image of what that looked like. You can see the hill and the Redcoats find, fighting hand-to-hand, -hand, in fact, with the militiamen. Check out the numbers. The Redcoats had about 3,000 troops. The Patriots were pretty well matched with 2,400 troops. But check out the difference in the number of men killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill and the number of men wounded. For the Patriots, the number of men killed were 115 compared with 226 men killed on the Redcoat side. The number of men wounded, 305 Patriots, 828 Redcoats. So the numbers would give you the impression that the Patriots had victory in this battle. But in fact, they did not. And the reason being is because they ran out of ammunition. Well, what happened was the Patriots began running out of ammunition, so... Prescott tells the men that they should not fire unless you see the whites of their eyes because you can't see the whites of someone's eyes from far away. But if they're close up, you can see it. So every shot that was fired was going to count um, at the end of this battle. The Redcoats kept coming despite being shot at up the hill. And you can see this in that painting, line after line going up the hill, despite the slaughter all around them. 
and the Patriots ran out of ammunition and had to surrender. Even though the Patriots lost this battle, the Redcoats realized that the Patriots were serious about this war and were not, it, were not going to be easy to beat in the long run. I love this image here of the Patriots watching as the Redcoat lines are coming up the hill toward them. All right, so where are we on the timeline now? Well, we're going to be looking at the Second Continental Congress voting to organize an actual army rather than just militia groups banding together. We've already talked about Thomas Paine and his very popular common sense brochure that's put out in January of 1776. We talked in class about George Mason publishing the Virginia Declaration of Rights in June of 1776. And now we're going to kind of move into the Declaration of Independence. And you know that this was signed on July 4th, 1776. So write down the Continental Army. And I would love for you to sketch out a little portrait of George Washington. So the Second Continental Congress meets together and they vote to organize an official army and the name is Continental Army. And they put George Washington, who has now gained experience through the French and Indian War, as the general of this new army. The Continental Congress meets in 1775 to make the Continental Army led by George Washington, but they meet again in the summer of 1776 to do something else that's just as important. They meet in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in that building shown there, which is called Independence Hall, and they debate with one another. That means argue whether to declare themselves as an independent nation or to stay under British rule. And in June and July, they argue it out back and forth, and they eventually vote for independence, which means that they become their own country. The document that declares the independence of the 13 colonies is known as the Declaration of Independence, hence the name. It is signed by many uh, famous Americans as well as some not famous Americans. And it was the official letter that broke us up with England. It was addressed to the King, George III, and it was drafted by Thomas Jefferson and revised and edited by John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. The Declaration of Independence is a letter to King George III that said the colonies are starting their own country will no longer be ruled by Great Britain and the reasons why. I want you to go ahead and draw a little sketch of the signers signing the Declaration of Independence near your notes here. Here's a few images to kind of give you an idea of what you can see here. Those are some of the drafts uh, that Thomas Jefferson drew up before the official Declaration of Independence was finished before he presented it to the Second Continental Congress. And here's just an image of some of the editing process going on. So that can encourage you when you're looking at your writing assignments in English. Drafting is one thing, but editing and revising can take a long time, but it's very needed and has been going on for hundreds of years. So who is John Hancock? Well, John Hancock was the richest man living in Massachusetts, and he made money through business and trade. So his business had been severely hurt from taxation laws from Britain. And can you imagine how much money he was losing every day due to the Intolerable Acts shutting down the Boston Harbor? He's also the leader or the president elected as the Second Continental Congress president. That was the meeting that decided to leave Great Britain and to become our own country. And he, in a very bold and daring move, signs his name the largest on the Declaration of Independence. So the Declaration of Independence basically lays out why the 13 colonies are becoming their own country. But then it opens itself up to a list of 27 grievances against the king. So there's a short part called, uh, that's the introduction. And then there is a list of grievances against the king. So what is a grievance? Well, a grievance is a complaint 
or something that the king and his government may have done wrong towards the colonies. And here's just a few of them. Um, in, in our own words, he continuously would veto laws that the colonies attempted to put in place that they believed were needed. As populations grew larger and larger, communities were formed, but the king refused to allow them equal representation in government. Government must be by the consent of the governed. And just like we've talked about over and over again, parliament refused to give them representation. 